Hello and welcome to this special edition of TMN Talks where we will be exploring what the federal budget means for music. My name is Vivian Kelly. I'm the Editorial Operations Manager at the Bragg Media, which includes the Music Network. Before we begin, I do want to say that First Nations people from all over the lands of the Gadigal people where I am now and all the different tribes and nations across the country have used music and storytelling for tens of thousands of years and continue to do so as the longest surviving continual culture in the world. I want to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and pay tribute to their ongoing contribution to the country's culture, stories and music. I am about to be joined by a panel of incredible minds and musicians to help explain what the recent federal budget means for music and those who work within it. The first of those panellists is Julia Robinson, the Head of Policy and Advocacy at ARIA. Welcome, Julia. Thank you for having me. We also have Adrian Collette, perhaps one of the most in-demand men in music at the moment as people try to work out what it all means. And he is the CEO of the uh, Australia Council. Welcome, Adrian. Good to be here. Thank you, Vivian. Hello, Julia. We, we also have Meredith Fannin, who is the founder of Dark Wave. Hello, and, uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> and finally, we have Josh Pike, who I'm sure you are all aware is an excellent musician and is also the PPCA chair. So welcome, Josh. Hey, thanks for having me. So every year when a budget is released, it is dis dissected, debated, and sometimes derided from all sections of industry, business, society, community, in lounge rooms and in boardrooms. But we don't often get to fully understand what it means for musicians because even though people think music is a big business there's actually not a lot of big businesses in music there's so many freelancers so many contractors so many people who might not have the opportunity to dive into the documents and work out what this means whether it's grants whether it's their superannuation whether it's tax whether it's uh extra funding so that's what we will hopefully be um coming to understand today Adrian, I did mention that you might be uh, quite in demand at the moment. We sort of already had a few indications of how the, this budget might go, but promises don't always uh, translate into action. So we had previously heard in January that the Music Australia would get $70 million in funding. Uh, we also heard about a centre uh, for uh, which would help people with their reporting of misconduct, but mm. a lot of that at the time for the mm. industry wasn't quite clear. You know, we had a lot mm. of big promises, but not a lot of detail. Mm. So have they come good on those promises? And do we have any more detail about what that might look like? Um, yes to both, um, emphatically yes to both. Um, it's worth saying that as a process, the way the cultural policy was set up uh, and then uh, deep consultation with the sector and then announced and then things that flowed from it, uh, that's about as effective and impactful as I've seen. Uh, and isn't it good that the Albanese government has ad adopted a cultural policy so early in its tenure? To get to your point um, and your question, Vivian, um, about $280 million has been uh, invested in arts and creativity over the coming four year period. We mustn't forget the 500 plus million that is going into our collecting institutions because we lived in a very joined up world. Um, and about 200 million of that over four years is, is going, I like to say through, not to <laughs> Creative <laughs> Australia as it will be uh, set up, we hope, by July 1. So, yes, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And 69.4 million of that is to establish Music Australia as a dedicated investment stream in contemporary music. Uh, and I think I can go into more detail of how, how the funding flows, but 
that is a really big win and more than a big win it's a real vote of confidence in the value of australian artistry and the value of this industry to the country and you mentioned that first of july looming deadline it is mid-may so that's uh that's not very far away uh do we have any details on how the board of this new uh, Creative Australia will be set up? Is it going to be music industry types, business types, bureaucrats? What's it going to look like? It's going to be light on bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> that I think I can, I can uh, firmly promise. Um, look, the process is this, and I don't want to labour it because other people have things to say, but, but the legislation is literally being drafted now. There was legislation in the last federal parliament to stand up Creative Australia in the prospect of it. There will be much more refined legislation going through early, we hope, in this round, and it's a priority of Minister Burke's, needless to say, through parliament. And that has to happen. And the legislation will be the thing that, that establishes Music Australia in its own right. So I can't second guess that. Obviously, we've been working very, very closely with the department, which is a good thing, and with the minister's office, which is also a good thing. Uh, but we're very confident that this will go through Parliament. And if all that happens, then Music Australia, along with Creative Australia, comes into being very close to July 1. And then the process of implementation really begins. We're not going from a standing start. We've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes so we can get out of the blocks as fast as possible. We've consulted broadly uh, with the industry. The minister will then appoint the board of Music Australia. And, and the importance of that is they will be advising us Music Australia on the strategic investments that need to be made over the next three to four years to, to really stand the sector in the best possible stead. And just to answer your question on this board, I think the sector will have to see itself there. So, so we have been talking through very broad consultation to artists first and foremost to uh, managers, artist managers, <laughs> incredible people who, who do this work. We've been talking to labels, both big and independent. We've been talking to people who write for screen, music for screen, uh, because we'll work very closely with our colleagues at Screen Australia. And, uh, and the diversity of the sector will have to see itself there. Um, and I'm really confident and it's important to know that Minister Burke will make these appointments. He will take good advice from us, from others. He's deeply connected to the sector, but they are his appointments to make. That is very, very likely. Um, so that you get a balance advising you on the strategy going forward. Now, Julia, uh, your boss, Annabel Heard at ARIA said, we cannot afford to get this wrong when it comes to the agenda and execution of Music Australia. You are the head of policy and advocacy at ARIA. So what was your message to the government ahead of this budget about what the industry needed? I think, um, I mean, look, thank you so much for having us and also thanks for having Adrian start, start us off. We could probably just all sit here and listen to Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> what's going to come to come uh, it's always very interesting but I think in terms of ahead of the budget actually most of the work was really done ahead of the policy um, so the policy sets sets that real agenda um, and the policy came out costed um, so ahead of the budget it was just about making sure that the numbers were still there because there's always that m micro moment when you wonder whether they're going to somehow deduct or or change those numbers so it was great to see those numbers were still there um, and then I think, you know, in terms of what, what our response to the policy, we did present at the recent Senate inquiry. And, and yeah, we did talk about how it's really important that we get this right. Um, we want to see a bold um, initiative taken by Music Australia. There's there's a lot that has fallen behind in the, in the in recent times, in the last decade. And I think we can't just keep doing things the same way. We need to think um, think through things differently. We need to see uh, some new strategies taken to try and um, make 
what is an amazing sector uh, industry uh, really grow and thrive. We've got everything kind of, you know, the, the baseline's always all, all there. We've got amazing artists, we've got incredible songwriters and um, and we've got the small businesses all sort of set up to, to work this through. But uh, there's parts of the the industry that are kind of um, broken in a way, you know, we've got an issue with discoverability. We've got so many songs being uploaded every day onto streaming services. It's just so hard to know what to play next. Um, and we need to somehow fix that. Um, discoverability is our number one, I guess, issue that we would like to see Music Australia um, really tackle. And we've been, we've not been shy in saying that. And I think most, most, most others are saying the same thing. So, uh, we, yeah, we think that it just really needs to, uh, it's great to hear Adrian say you're ready to hit the ground running. I'm hopeful that that, you know, the pavement's been um, properly laid and there's no cracks and, and that you can in fact do that. And um, we've, we're really excited to see what can happen there. And also, I think, you know, we've had unprecedented commitment from the New South Wales Labor government as well in the last election. So, you know, that just helps to boost the whole story that, you know, music's getting focused on. Um, it is it is everywhere. You can't sort of escape it. We all listen to it all the time. Um, Australians listen to over 20 hours of music a week. I'd like to see, you know, how much sport that we that we watch, <laughs> over, whether it's over 20 hours a week. But I, I dare say that, you know, you're listening to music more. So it's really important. It's a really important part of everyone's lives. Now, Meredith, both Adrian and Julia have alluded to the fact that a lot of what we heard from the budget was sort of pre-promised or outlined in the cultural policy document. But there's always other things in there that might not even be just specific to music. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, most musicians are small business people. They work for themselves. A lot of artists and managers and all of those people aren't actually part of a big corporation where their superannuation is guaranteed and their tax is automatically sorted. So was there anything in there that will change the lives of musicians and small business workers in this industry to do with, you know, super or tax or all those little things in the weeds that, let's admit it, most creative people hate to think about? Um, so it wasn't exactly part of the announced budget, but it was announced just previously before that to do with superannuation and Contractors in particular, contractors working in not only the music industry, but are in theatre and film. So essentially what they've said is that if you work, if you're a sole trader and you work in any of those types of industries, uh, you are entitled to super on top of what your labour fee is. So um, which means that it'll help people that are small business and sole traders and don't necessarily have employers that are putting away super for them, it will just give them some sort of certainty moving forward that they will be able to start to collect a nest egg for themselves and build up their super over time. So um, that was a, um, that's that's now on the ATO's website. It's very clear that they are entitled to super, so it's not a gray area. Mm. Um, it does only apply to people that are sole traders. So if you're you know, a partnership, a trust or a company, it doesn't apply to you but it does apply to people that are sole traders. Um, and that's effective. The ATO changed their dialogue on the website in November of 2022. So effectively now is when, you know, you really should be starting to see super being paid on any type of work that you are performing or, or doing for anyone in the arts and creative industries. Um, on top of that, there was something in the budget about super that, and it's essentially to do with same day super. So basically from 1st of July, 2026, um, when you get paid a wage, if you are getting paid any uh, an employee of anyone, um, you will get paid super the same day as your payroll goes through. So yeah, they've got a three year window to get all of the single touch payroll and all the software systems to make sure that that works effectively. But yeah, that'll come through. So I think that'll be really helpful for people as well, just to have certainty over their um, super and to make sure it builds up over time. Now, Josh, back in 2009, uh, I was dating somebody who decided I wasn't very cool 
And part of his mission to make me cool was to buy me the Triple J Hottest 100 CD at the time. And your song, Lighthouse, uh, was on there. So, um, you know, I'd just like to say to him, what is cooler than talking to Josh Pike <laughs> about the budget? So I think I finally um, made it. <laughs> Um, we are both we are both mega cool right now talking yeah. about you. Uh, <laughs> um, that's where it's as, at. as a musician and as an artist, how do you find engaging with the budget? Like, were there any key takeaways or or things that will affect your day to day life as a performer? Uh, I think I mean beyond the actual policy stuff, which you know, Music Australia and Creative Australia, those those initiatives. Um, are enormous for the industry. I think the thing that really affects us on a day-to-day -day level is uh, almost the psychological element of this enormous acknowledgement of uh, musicians as not only small business owners, but like, you know, contributors to the GDP, contributors to the cultural economy of Australia. Um, and so I think for me, particularly having been doing this for 20 years now, we're coming from a really low baseline, um, you know, sad to say. And so to feel this acknowledgement from government um, that we are an important part of Australia, uh, for me, that's the biggest thing day to day that it has really affected me. I just feel for the, for the first time in a long time, a real sense of hope for our industry. Um, I love the idea that there's going to be a more of a collective and holistic approach from government to our industry you know, ranging from all the way from school all the way through to, you know, uh, pathways leading to, um, you know, people my age, you know, in my 40s within the industry, having pathways to follow and having that those pathways supported by government through things like Music Australia and Creative Australia. So, yeah, apart from the actual nuts and bolts of it, it's the real psychological feeling of acknowledgement that I think is important for the industry and artists in particular. And you mentioned there, Josh, um, everything from schools upwards. So there was 2.6 million set aside for school arts education. We know that we as a country and as a culture invest in sports at such a grassroots and local level. Do you think this is sort of the first sign that we're going to start investing more in building up a pipeline of music industry professionals by starting doing a more robust education at the schoolyard level? Oh, I really hope so. I mean, my own kids are 12 and 10, and they have um, a pretty good music uh, program at their public school. But uh, I'm involved in the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. We're putting on a, a huge fundraiser. Um, and we've noticed that all the schools we've approached, a lot of them don't have music programs at all. So it's, it's, I think it's pretty common knowledge that um, there's a real dearth of, of music education in Australia. Um, I know, like I wasn't, for instance, able to do music uh, for my HSC when I was in high school. Um, and I just think it's part of a, a broad education and it should be, you know, beyond even just the industry side of things, just morally, it should be part of our education far more, you know, far more importantly. Um, and certainly we see things like the Swedish model where kids are taught about not just music, but the, the concept of songwriting and poetry and uh, within schools from primary school onwards. And we've seen how their industry is incredibly robust, not just from a performing point of view, but also from a actual uh, uh, songwriting point of view. So, and that starts at school. So I'd love to see that kind of thing being supported and implemented within Australia. Julia, do you think that level of support from a young age will help Australia compete more on the global stage? Yeah, I think that that's super important. As Josh has mentioned, you know, there are other markets that prove this point. Um, and then I think, you know, what the build on that will need to be, what you can do from not only sort of setting yourself up with that music um, education and learning songwriting and learning uh, the craft is to then sort of move into that, um, that commercial mindset and learning how 
you know, we mentioned uh, artist managers, but how artists as well can really get that full and thorough understanding of themselves as a business, as we've spoken about as well, that these, you know, these artists are businesses in and of themselves, they're their own sort of microcosm of a business. Um, but that education on, you know, these issues like superannuation um, and tax, uh, you know, it, there's, there's no real good connection for artists and artist managers to um, really understand those issues. And they really do almost need to be accountants and legal experts, uh, you know, travel agents is probably another important thing that they need to learn the skill for. And those kind of connections need to be built, um, yeah, from, from the very early age. Speaking of that, Meredith, do you have any advice for musicians or sole traders in this industry who really don't understand this level of financial detail, like they hate superannuation, they live month to month because they've got so many outstanding invoices that people haven't paid, they finally get one paid and the last thing they can sort of think about is, okay, well, some of this is for tax, some of this is for super, like they've just got bills to pay and their own invoices to pay. How can they start to get on top of that when they've got such a creative brain and other things going on, but they also have to worry about being experts in this? Yeah, I, th I find that the easiest thing that they can do is to break it down into, into divisions. And it's not so much that they should just sort of hand it all over to someone else and say, you just deal with it. I think mm -hmm. it's really important that they actually understand it themselves um, to a certain extent. They may not necessarily have to do all the nuts and bolts of it, but certainly being able to understand it and know how their money flows is really important. So the best thing to do is to find someone that doesn't necessarily need to be an accountant. It could be a friend or someone that's quite business savvy to just sort of sit down with them and kind of even like take them down to a um, really like basic level of how their money flows, where the ins and outs are, maybe setting themselves up a, like a personal budget of what they need to live on um working out what tax they might have to set aside so then they've got in their mind okay well I'll, and a lot of the time they'll set up separate bank accounts so they'll have like one that has a, everything going through it in terms of their income and then they'll have a separate one that's for tax and then they'll have a, a one that they actually transfer out to even if they're a sole trader it's like they pay themselves a wage although it's not really a wage but it's sort of like money that goes into a personal account that they know is theirs that they can spend and they can do whatever they like with um it's just good to break it down to that segmented level i think um otherwise yeah it is really confusing and i think sometimes um can be quite overwhelming and then it gets sort of left to the side because it's not uh it's not exciting, it's not creative, and it's um it's probably something that they would the least thing, thing they want to do the least um rather than everything else. So yeah. On a bigger scale, Adrian, we've got quite a lot of money floating around, whether it's that 69.4 million funding commitment over four years for Music Australia, whether it's the 35.5 million investment in First Nations arts and culture. Yeah and the 2.6 million I mentioned set aside for school arts and education. Yeah. That's a lot of promising promises, but what are the risks for the industry if the cash commitment isn't utilised to its full potential? Oh, look, the risk for the industry, I mean, as Julia said, the through the very, very extensive discussions we've been having and through our own knowledge, the Australian artistry is is thriving, but the business models have got really complicated. You know, the old ways of breaking a band and the series of gatekeepers, whether you like them or not, that world has changed completely. Um, for me, it's almost back to the future now that <laughs> to break a band nationally, you have to break them internationally first. So there are a whole lot of issues about how do you invest and get artists ready for that? We do an amazing job. Sounds Australia clearly does a brilliant job. But this is about, this is not a grant making issue. This is how do you invest in artists? How do you get them to use that phrase I'm hearing all the time, export ready, so they can, they can have real impact over time internationally, which now, like it or not, seems to be one of the absolute necessities if you want if you want to break bands and songwriters and enrich the Australian songbook nationally because of what's happened with streaming there has to be an investment response through the precious dollars 
there also has to be a policy response. And that's why I think we're very well placed, given our minister's interest in creating good policy. I, I'd just like to say a couple of things so people uh, have a very real view of how this will flow. If you look at the budget papers in detail, the, the funding is very back-ended. You know, it, the, the majority of it flows in the last two to three years, three to four years. Now, while it might be painful for a while, that's not a bad thing because we really have to stand this thing up in the best possible way. Uh, we will get money out the door and into artists' hands as fast as we can, but I just want everyone to be aware it grows over time. And the good news in that is if we get this right and it's respected, it's the last number that is the continuing number, if you know what I mean. The other thing I would say is we have to work whole of government. A lot of the educational imperatives that Josh was talking about, that's why you have a cultural policy. It's not an arts policy. It's a whole of government cultural policy, which means you have a platform to talking to the education department or foreign affairs or any of the other departments you need, First Nations by definition, so that you can really start to leverage whole of government policy around the ambitions of music making. Um, and the final thing on whole of government, it's whole of governments. We've already met with Minister Graham, uh, who's made an extraordinary commitment, you know, over $100 million in four years in contemporary music in New South Wales. We are getting better at working across the national and state level. We've now got to get better at working with local government because nearly a third of our national funding pie flows from local government. And if you want to have uh, music on the ground in communities, the music hubs that are outlined in the national cultural policy, you have to get alignment between how all this money is being invested because good things don't happen in an abstract policy, they happen in place. So I think, I think the big dynamic here is having a dedicated investment stream, not a grant making stream, an investment stream for contemporary music, and then to get the best possible advice on how we build that framework and start to implement it over time. You know, there are major issues emerging around discoverability, as Julia said, around export readiness, around skills and training, both for artist managers, for artists themselves. But at the moment, as we know, coming out of COVID, there's just a huge issue about how many people have fled from the industry and yeah. the government's making investments at all sorts of levels through training institutions. We've heard a lot about on the job uh, training as well. So, so that's the task ahead of us is to get the priorities as right as we can to begin with and then grow them over that period. So Josh, just before we wrap up, I mentioned there's been a lot of promising promises. Adrian has talked about, you know, that longer term pipeline rather than just being a grants factory. As an artist, what will success look like for you over the next few years in terms of how this funding and how this policy is rolled out? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, I think the, the the biggest thing is, would you know, part of what success would look like is that these things actually happen, obviously. So seeing uh, Creative Australia and Music Australia, um, you know, fully realised. And I guess for me, success would look like having I mean, Adrian spoke, you know, very encouragingly about having um, representation on board and steering committees, et cetera, from artists. Um, and I think that's really important. And for me, that's what success would look like as well, because I do think that, you know, um, if you can find the right artists to speak about these things, then they're the ones that really know exactly what we need. Um, so I think part of what success would look like is is that representation that Adrian was really, um, you know, encouragingly speaking about. And really, I mean, I guess you can, you know, in a few years you could crunch the numbers and see how many artists we have overseas. But it's 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 more than that. It's it's really um, something that's hard to define because it's it is 
it's a cultural thing. It's not just, uh, you know, a stats thing. So I think it'd be very hard to define what success is. Um, but uh, yeah, mainly it would be representation within these really powerful and potentially influential bodies by artists um, themselves to be able to advocate for themselves. Now, this is normally uh, the part at an event where I would ask uh, the crowd to thank how wonderful panelists. Uh, so for anyone watching in the boardroom, meeting room, bedroom, lounge room, wherever they may be, um, I will just ask you to acknowledge our excellent panelists, Julia Robinson from ARIA, Adrian Collette from the Australia Council, Meredith Fannin from Dark Wave and Josh Pike, the musician and PPCA chair. Thank you so much for joining us today for TMN Talks about what the federal budget means for music. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.